Hi, my name is Sharon Chen, and this video is the second part of the Introduction to Respiratory Viruses, giving you an overview of all respiratory viruses with a focus on the virus. The learning objectives are to recognize the epidemiology and main route of transmission of the respiratory viruses, to recognize appropriate use of diagnostic tests for viral respiratory syndromes, and to explain the techniques used for diagnosing specific viral infections. Here's the pathogen list for our course, and in this video and the entire module, I will be discussing these viruses that cause respiratory infections. Now, let's talk about the virus and how the clinical syndromes relate to the life cycle of the virus. What viruses want to do is spread to other hosts, essentially exit. The strategy that respiratory viruses have evolved is to replicate quickly, reaching high numbers of viruses causing acute infection. They cause symptoms in people to then exit from that person. For example, you can see this man sneezing, and he's spreading high titers of viral particles to another person through droplets and aerosolization of his secretions. All respiratory viruses transmit in the same way. And another similarity between the respiratory viruses is an RNA genome, with one exception, which is adenovirus. This allows them to mutate and avoid immune surveillance. Because of the ability to mutate, many of these viruses have multiple serotypes, with RSV being an exception. Despite these similarities, they cause different clinical syndromes. The virus evolved to find its preferred means of causing infection and disease. This image looks at the clinical syndromes relative to the virus. It's essentially the same information that I discussed already, but I want to repeat an important point. Each of these respiratory viruses can cause multiple clinical syndromes. For example, RSV and human metanumavirus mostly cause bronchiolitis. You can see the hump on the graph, but sometimes it can cause a common cold. Another difference between respiratory viruses is that they cause illness in different seasons. Adenovirus is constant and doesn't have seasonality. Parainfluenza peaks in the late fall, but RSV mostly occurs in the winter. The seasonality suggests that there are virus-specific and immunologic-specific reasons for these differences. You can see from this image that several of them peak in the winter. All of us realize that we get more respiratory infections in the winter, and this may be due to a more crowded environment, allowing the virus to transmit easily from person to person. Now, I told you before that most, of, for the most part, you will not know which virus is causing your patient's symptoms. Usually, respiratory virus infections are diagnosed clinically, which is why we wanted to teach you the clinical syndromes. However, there are certain times when identifying the virus is important, and you'll have to decide when to do these tests on your patient. Here are some reasons for ordering tests on an individual patient. For example, you may choose to give antiviral therapy for a patient with influenza. Or if the patient is hospitalized or has severe disease, you'll likely want to know why the patient is so sick. For immune-compromised patients, you may want to give experimental antiviral therapy. In some patients, you could actually avoid empiric antibiotic therapy. The other reason is to place all patients who have respiratory virus infections in the same area of the hospital. This is, a, this is called cohorting. It decreases the chance of spread of the virus to other patients in the hospital. A third main reason for identifying a virus is to investigate an epidemic of a respiratory virus. This is important in case the virus found is a new emerging virus. Now, studies are done on respiratory viruses, which is the only way I can tell you about the clinical syndromes and seasonality of the, these viruses. Identifying viruses is crucial in these epidemiology studies. The image on the right shows you how we obtain samples to identify a virus. It is called a nasopharyngeal swab, and it needs to be put all the way to the back of the nasopharynx in order to get the correct sample. I hope you can see how far you need to insert the swab. If you've ever had one of these, you know it's a bit uncomfortable. But it's very important to do the collection correctly. Otherwise, you will not be able to identify the virus. Once you collect a sample, you'll have to decide what test to do. And this table shows you the different methods available. You will hear about all these different tests when you start clinics. Different hospitals use different methods. For example, until very recently, our hospital used the first method that detects viral proteins by antibody testing for the viral antigen. These tests are very fast, and we had an entire panel that tested most of the respiratory viruses. The disadvantage is that these tests may be negative if the sample doesn't have a lot of viral antigen. This may be because of sample bias or because it just wasn't collected well. So now our hospital is using the second method, which detects viral genetic material with molecular methods. We now test for more virus including rhinovirus. Molecular methods are much more sensitive. One of the new patterns we are finding are patients who have multiple viruses at the same time. Not all hospitals have this type of test because it's quite expensive. 
In the past, viral culture was the gold standard. You can directly isolate the virus, but this is a slow test, and sometimes you don't even get the answer until after the patient is better. The last method is serology. This test looks for the antibody response to the virus, so it's different compared to the other tests that I just talked to you about. It doesn't detect the presence of the virus. This test can be used after an infection has cleared.